Good morning and welcome to this post-budget review right here on CNBC Africa. Well, in the just over 1 trillion rand budget delivered by Finance Minister Praveen Gordon yesterday, it was announced that South Africa's national expenditure would be revised down by 10.4 billion rand over the next three years. This a response to tight fiscal conditions and 2012-2013 tax revenues falling 16.3 billion rand. That below the 2012 budget projection. So we're faced with a country that's now expected to borrow more to fund state spending, increasing the country's net debt to 40.3% of GDP. Those just some of the macro headline figures that have uh, uh, needed to be digested. How it's all being interpreted the morning after well joining me with their views this morning Dave Moore who's Citadel's chief investment strategist Madeleine Schubert who's a tax and fiduciary specialist at Citadel as well and Professor Alan Hirsch who's the director of the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice at the University of Cape Town he's also the former deputy director general of the Department of Performance Monitoring and Evaluation in the presidency we also have in studio this morning a live audience with us who will be able to pose questions to the guests that coming up a little later on uh, in the next 60 minutes but before we get into all of this and into the discussion here's a snippet from the finance minister's address yesterday afternoon so there are parallels honorable members between the global economic discourse on the one hand and our own policy challenges in seeking a pragmatic balance between recovery and consolidation well, Dave, it's uh, within that broad context that we had a budget presented yesterday. Being highlighted was that the National Development Plan specifically was the point of departure for the budget, but where the aims and targets have been laid out, it's the how-to that's uh, really in the spotlight at this stage. In your books, has that been adequately addressed? Well, I think if you, if you look at the budget, we've got to go back to the quote that the, uh, we got from the minister there is, is we've got to see this against the background of what's been happening internationally and also locally. So we're working with economic growth that has slowed down globally last year, we had a synchronized slowdown. Plus we're working from a base where most countries have still got budget deficits that are uncomfortably high. And you're faced with a question, how are you going to tackle this dilemma? Uh, we've seen the sort of UK European way of fiscal austerity first and then growth. Um, and the more sort of U.S. approach to say first growth and then gradual fiscal austerity. I think it's quite clear from the budget we're going more the U.S. route, something that I agree with. And I think that will give us the base to then address uh, the national development program. Because I think at this stage it's a question we've got to consolidate our fiscal situation first, but we need more growth to be able to do that. Austerity versus stimulus, where do you sit on that side of the debate, Madeleine? Sure. Um, I'm a tax specialist, so I'm actually going to hand it over to <laughs> Alan, so he can join in earlier. Um, <laughs> Let's so get your view then, Alan. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think Dave's right. I think that the, the balance has to, to lean towards um, investment. Um, as much as we've got the fiscal space to do that, unfortunately, when the recession began, we had significant fiscal space. Our debt is rising. Um, it's rising considerably, but as long as we ensure that it's well spent and that the invest investments projects, the infrastructure projects are well targeted and they add to our competitiveness and our productivity, um, it is a very, it's, one of the, it's one of the few things we can do at the moment that's going to help us to grow in the medium term. In the short term, it may not help a great deal, and I think uh, we have a difficult short term. I was listening to Conrad Royce yesterday off uh, Standard & Poor's post-budget, and he was very cl critical, putting that exact implementation back into the foreground, uh, you know, and saying, bottom line, that it's only an improved growth picture that's going to, uh, you know, get them feeling a little less negative than they are about South Africa at the moment. So what, do you, what do you make of that stance that's been adopted by ratings agencies like Standard & Poor's? Um, well, I don't want to specifically comment on, on that comment, but clearly growth is incredibly important. If we don't grow, we can't create jobs. Um, there's never really been jobless growth in South Africa. When we've grown above 4 or 5 percent, we've created lots of jobs, including unskilled jobs, including jobs in the informal sector. So we have to find a way to get back to growth. Mm -hmm. um, and that means both in economic policy through the budget and through finding ways to improve the environment for private sector investment, 
but also I think politically in terms of getting um, more confidence in the policies and the, the nature of government going forward. So I think government needs to work very hard to b rebuild and to build stronger relationships with, with the major investors domestically and internationally. Well, yesterday we certainly heard uh, the finance minister and consensus from him that we need to start seeing growth happening faster right here in South Africa. Let's take a listen to that comment. National development must also be coupled with fiscal sustainability, which ensures that the progress we make will not be interrupted or reversed. The government relies on resources derived from the wider economy. And the best way to generate resources or tax revenues is to grow the economy faster and increase the tax base. Mm -hmm. Madeleine, we're going to be getting into the tax perspective on things in just a bit because quite a few surprises coming to the fore on that front. Before we do, though, overall, uh, your comment and your overall impression of the budget that was delivered yesterday because the minister highlighting that a budget has little room for expansion but highlighting at the same time that there are significant opportunities for change. Hmm. Well, purely from a tax perspective, I mean, the one thing that you noted there was to increase, increase our tax base, because if you look at the wider population, obviously there's a very small percentage that do contribute towards um, tax, paying taxes. Um, so I think one thing he probably is going to look at is try to increase the tax base in general to get more funders for revenue funds. But um, it's the how, and that how is actually going to come directly by creating opportunities to start working for youth to come into the mainstream because a lot of those graduates never get a position. So it will basically by st starting slowly with entering level youth, work them up, the base will increase mm -hmm. by um, really looking, I guess he also tackles the companies, um, complaining about tax avoidance in certain instances. Um, although mo many of them really just apply the tax laws as they are. So it's really for him to, to see how he can increase the base because the onerous on this few that's paying at the moment is, is harsh. That's exactly it, and that's why the emphasis placed on growth specifically by the likes of a Conrad Royce. Uh, Dave, if we're looking at uh, you know, the, p the position we're in right now, of course South Africa wants to avoid another downgrade because uh, it's when that happens that your cost of debt starts to escalate uh, quite materially exacerbating financial woes uh, with debt already above that 40 percent mark are you comfortable that we're sitting with a debt level that is sustainable at this point i think if we can stick to more or less the broad outlines of what he tried to achieve in this budget i don't think our debt situation will become unsustainable mm -hmm. i think that i haven't got a major worry about that i, I think the gradual reduction of the deficit as the economy keeps growing um, you know given the low interest rates that we have at the moment and it looks like it's we're still going to have it because it internationally rates appear to be you know going low for some time I think those numbers add up so I'm, I'm not as alarmed as, as he would be in terms of the fiscal sustainability of it where I do think that one is worried is that there's only so much that you can achieve with a budget then it comes down to the various departments to actually deliver in terms of the numbers. And there South Africa has got you know, a, a very bad track record in terms of we spend in critical areas of, of education and health and other areas large, a large part of our total income on that. Mm -hmm. So if you look at those expenditures relative to the size of the economy. Um, if we ever look at the return that we get on that, I think that's a major problem in terms of the budget. You know? so the, the, there's so much that the minister can do in terms of doing the numbers. He's the financial director, but the financial director at the end of the day is not going to run the company at grassroots level. And I think that's where we need to think about it. Plus, obviously, there are some policy issues over and above the budget issues that would concern us and that definitely would concern the um, rating agencies as well. Let's uh, take a look at uh, the tax side of things now. I mean, uh, you know, we've had uh, the three options being for government at this stage, borrow more, spend less or raise more revenue. And on that revenue raising side, were you surprised at the fact that we saw a 7 billion rand in personal income tax relief coming through? No mention of a raising in corporate taxes as well, because I think bulk of South Africa uh, was expecting a raising of some sort, uh, given the kind of predicament the finance minister finds himself in this year. Um, in a way, we kind of not expected not to have an increase in, in taxes right now, especially last year with the raise in capital gains tax. 
the dividends tax, the foreign dividends, all those raises came through. And um, so it's not unexpected, but the, the saving is handing back to the wider population is really just to adjust for inflation and then your primary rebates as well. So, if, but if you actually go into the detail document, which is not part of your normal budget speech, then there is very other things where he actually is taking back. So he is giving, but he is definitely taking back because there's a lot in other places which he didn't mention in the main speech mm -hmm. where he's definitely going to recover any kind of giving back. So I think from my perspective, it was really quite um, neutral from a tax perspective, give and take. I don't know if, if Dave would like to add a little bit there. Yeah, I think if you look at $7 mm. billion, it sounds a lot to the individual, but in terms of the mm. budget, as you said, <laughs> of over a trillion, um, mm. it's actually very small. And compared to other years, it's small. So I think mm. in, in sort of the higher income categories, uh, I just glanced at it on the plane last mm. night, but he probably didn't even c cater for um, fiscal drag at all. Mm -hmm. uh, at the lower end, yes, it was fine. Mm. So yes, um, mm. but relative to the expectations, a lot of people expected the top marginal rate to go up to 42%. Uh, there was a lot of speculation about the dividend tax going up to 20% because of what they've done in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective, you know, it was uh, it was encouraging to me again that they kept the major tax rates the same, yeah. and they are waiting for the economy to grow and therefore close the deficit. The key is going to be whether they can keep the lid on the spending that they are projecting, and mm -hmm. it looks like for the last year they've been fairly successful in that. Well, uh, we've uh, alluded to it uh, earlier on in the conversation. This was pretty much a compliance-themed uh, budget that was delivered in yesterday's uh, session, and uh, certainly that emphasized as uh, important in uh, order to actually grow that revenue base while we wait for economic growth to actually filter through. Here's what the finance minister had to say about tax avoidance and how they're looking to address that issue. The budget review outlines various measures proposed to protect the tax base and limit the scope for tax leakage and avoidance. The taxation of trusts will come under review in order to control some of the abuse that goes on at present. Modifications are proposed to the tax treatment of employment share schemes and disability or income protection policies. Outstanding difficulties in the distinction between debt and equity will be addressed, and it is proposed that foreign businesses which sell e-books, music, or other digital goods and services to South Africans should be required to register as VAT vendors in line with our VAT regulations. <laughs> These are the same provisions that have been adopted by the European Union and other, other uh, jurisdictions around, across the world. Alan, at the end of the day, though, the ultimate aim is to get more people into the system. So job creation, a priority. Uh, we had the minister saying yesterday that any person who isn't disabled should have a job, uh, you know, and uh, that a little bit more likely now in the mining sac sector. We had no uh, taxes being implemented on that front, but that review, uh, you know, coming through still. So we're still waiting with bated breath. What does this mean, though? Does this actually lead us to policy and regulatory uncertainty? because that, in fact, is what makes investors more skittish than actual taxes themselves. The, 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 the statement about mining taxation, possibly. I mean, I don't know what discussions have taken place behind the scenes between uh, the minister, maybe the minister of minerals and, and, and the mining industry. There might be some discussion in which um, there's some indication of, of what the intentions are. But if, uh, if it's a very general kind of a statement without any, without any specifics and without any background, it could make people skittish. On the other hand, I think that it, that it should be said that the relationship between the government and the mining industry and the miners has improved in the last um, several months, obviously since the Marikana disaster. There were many efforts on all sides to re-establish relationships, and it seems that there are now open doors all round um, as much as possible and that um, problems are solved more quickly and that processes are established where, where, where mining companies and, and, and government are able to engage quite effectively. So 
Um, you know, obviously there, there's some big issues hanging over our heads. Uh, what happens in the Anglo Platinum case? Um, no, I, I don't certainly know what's going to happen there, but there is a process, and there's a process of of open discussion um, of the most important players, and I think that might help to rebuild confidence and encourage investment. Madeleine, what's your view on that front? I mean, is it more a matter now of when those taxes uh, come to the fore uh, than them not coming to the fore at all? Regarding to the comment he just made, I mean, in that little comment they just played now, there was there was a lot of different aspects. I mean, it goes it starts with the trust and taxation of trust and dealing with that. I mean, that's been under the spotlight, but uh, currently the way we apply tax laws for trust is really what's in the Income Tax Act. So mm -hmm. if you apply it strictly and by the book, you can get tax benefits, but it's using the existing legislation. Now, some of those existing legislation they're going to probably relook at. For example, some of the income that's coming through this, what we call in a tax law, a conduit and principle. So it's like a pipe. Income comes in the top and it goes out at the bottom. So it's in dividends come in and it comes out as a dividend. So they're really looking at that basic principle, which already could potentially change the dras drastically the may way we tax the trust. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely trust is under, under a bit of scrutiny. But it, it re reiterates the principle. It's not necessarily tax evasion or avoidance. It's using what's in the legislation and abide to that. Yeah. I mean, you also made reference to um, re-looking at your debt and equity. I mean, there's a lot of financial structures that's currently uh, used in an in, in industry where the line between what is debt and what is equity is not always that clear. So there's various like hybrid instruments, and the tax laws don't necessarily fit to that specific fitting. So you've got to. It's becoming more complex as we get also pro pro probably part of the global world economy to bring in those products into South Africa. And it's just really looking at all those tax taxation laws. Again, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. I mean, it will still have to come through the legal process. You're going to go have to do the draft legislation. There will be public comment. And it's got to, at the end of the day, it's got to work for both the state and the mm -hmm. public to have a fine balance between the two. Where those conversations are happening, David, what do you make of this review of the tax regime that is going to be kicking off now? I think a lot of people are speculating. I think the general expectation is it means higher taxes. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, if you look at the, the track record of government thus far, I mean, I, the, our tax rates are, you know, I think competitive internationally. I don't think that, you know, that review would change it. It's more a question to see whether everybody's paying his or her fair share, um, and certainly whether corporates are paying their fair share as well. Yeah. So I don't, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to predict what these things are going to happen. I was quite encouraged that he named uh, Dennis Davis uh, to head that up, that thing. So I think they he always seems to me a, to a person who's got a lot of common sense. So if common sense prevails, I think it'll be a good thing. Okay, let's take a look at the tax incentives that have been put on the table here. Tax incentives on the table, Madeleine, uh, for employers uh, to employ first-time job seekers. Effective mechanism in your books. Uh, have the learnership tax breaks, for example, done the trick? I think for the, the learner tax, um, tax breaks been around for quite a while. And the idea was that when somebody joined, you get a tax deduction, and the end, you get a tax deduction. Whether the uptake was necessary there, I, I don't really have the number, so I can't tell you. But obviously, it wasn't enough mm -hmm. because it didn't stimulate the process enough. How exactly how this incentive is going to work, I don't know the detail exactly, but it looks like you pretty much will have some sort of a tax deduction until the employment earner earns about just under the tax threshold. So the moment he goes over the basic tax threshold, you will fall out of that, that incentive. It's, I think it's very encouraging. Um, we have to start somewhere. I mean, and I think it will, it will work. But you got to, tax law is not the only thing that's going to drive employment. You got to look at labour laws as well. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's this is just a part of it. The labour side of it needs to marry the tax law for the employer to actually take on employment. Before we get on to labour law and where policy stands in that regard in South Africa, whether or not we're too rigid, uh, let's take a look at this youth employment incentive that's been put on the table because it pretty much equates to the youth wage subsidy. While you've got uh, quarters that are encouraged by the development, you've got those quarters who stand in, st in stark opposition to it coming to the fore, the likes of uh, Kasatu. What's your view on initiatives like this? Well, um, I don't. Uh, there's no details have been given of the of the proposal around the around the tax incentive for youth employment. Um, 
I, I tend to think, I mean, I think that any attempt to encourage uh, the employment of unemployed young people is a good idea. The disadvantage of doing it as a tax incentive relative to a grant is that it helps the larger companies rather than the smaller companies. Tax incentives are, are something you have to manage and, and tax incentives presume that you're in a significant tax paying position. So it will encourage larger companies perhaps. It, unfortunately the small and medium companies who are the companies who really should be taking on people will probably find it a bit more complicated to deal with the such a tax incentive yeah. rather than a, than a subsidy. But I think the key thing is, is really the demand side, um, you know, the, is, is how to um, encourage higher levels of investment um, because we, we didn't have any difficulty in increasing employment when we were growing at between 5 and 6% mm -hmm. during that period. And we really, uh, you know, growth is, is the key focus. Um, there, may be, there may be several thousand or even hundred thousand youths who, who get jobs who wouldn't otherwise have done so in the situation and that's great but the jobs problem is bigger than that. Where uh, Alan Madalena has made a, st a distinction between big business and smaller business, uh, we did see a tax relief being put on the table for small business operating in South Africa. How much relief do you see that bringing? Because on that front as well, detail pretty, uh, pretty scant. Yes, I mean at the moment for small business corporations there is, there is um, preferred tax rates. There are certain write-offs that you can do on a quicker basis that a normal company would do. And then if they sell assets to a certain value they will get a preferential tax and um, capital gains tax treatment. So when I just had a look at, at the numbers last night, s there was a slight adjustment to, to the CGT rates etc. But from, from listening to the general public, listening to the radio and TV myself, it doesn't seem that it's enough. They, they feel there should be more incentives because in the end of the day these small businesses, tax is not necessarily the main problem. The main problem is cost. So it's still a cost to something but if you cost exceeds your income then you're basically in a cease loss position and then tax is not necessarily a driver, yeah. which is Alan has alluded to as well. So you've got to do more to assist. Absolutely. Yeah. That uh, cost scenario in South Africa we've seen from the results that have been coming through this earnings season really acting as a huge burden on business, big and small alike. When it comes to those special economic zones, were you encouraged by the fact that we're seeing some renewed activity on that front, Dave, because tax incentives offer there too to enhance this initiative even further? Yes, mm -hmm. I think, and I think the, the general principle again applies. As Alan has said, I mean, you must try and get the economy growing, and I think you know, if it was easy to get the, the economy growing by merely changing taxes, then, you know, we would have had growing economies all over the world. So that's sort of my skeptical view of it. Um, but if you look at growth in South Africa, you know, unfortunately it goes much wider than the budget. It goes much wider than a few tax incentives. I think those are the things we've got to look at. So again, just to repeat the point that I made earlier, um, you know, the impact of the budget was not yesterday. I think in terms of financial markets, we always like to look at it as if you know, that was the big day and this is the impact on financial markets. But it starts from you know, next month when departments have got to implement the budget, they've got to do things correctly, they've got to improve the efficiency of the tax system. And I mean the tax system is producing you know, large tax numbers if you look at almost a trillion uh, for this year. And I think that's the key thing to growth and if we can get that right, um, that will create the demand that will you know, naturally come from, from improved growth in the economy. And, and then all these other you know, fights about whether we should have a youth subsidy or whether it should be some tax break or something like that, those things will disappear over time. Yeah. But in the interim, I suppose you do need those things uh, to happen. Just in terms of the tax, uh, sorry, the cost base of South Africa, we must not underestimate, I mean, we talk a lot about infrastructure development on the one side. And when we look at how we want to fund the infrastructure development, it's through these huge increases in the user, user charges for that. And I think that's something critical we have to look at, because we're pushing up the cost base of the economy tremendously. Especially those smaller companies who struggle more, the baker who needs electricity, those kind of things. And um, I just caught a glimpse of some of the deficit numbers that he was producing uh, looking three years out. And it still appears as if the, the state-owned enterprises plan to borrow very little relative to the size of the economy for the next three years. And I think 
If there's something government has to look at in terms of their impact on the economy, mm -hmm. it's how much we want to borrow for the infrastructure program mm -hmm. and how much do we want to fund through merely increasing electricity tariffs and water tariffs and all of the others. Because an investment in infrastructure yields long-term returns. And therefore, you've got to match you know, your, your potential returns are getting longer term with longer term funding. So, David, uh, Dave, when it comes to uh, borrowing, I mean, we've got the government planning to borrow what $1.5 billion in the international markets, and uh, they're pretty much riding on the sentiment that's uh, associated with uh, South Africa being included in the WIGB and the appetite that's been, uh, you know, triggered as a result for South African bonds. What do you make of that endeavor right now and uh, investors, their appetite for South African bonds right now? I think if, if we look at bonds, yes, we've been included in the WIGBY, et cetera, and that's played a role. I think the search for yield, because interest rates are very low in the major economies, is the major you know, that's, that, that's the major reason for the flood of money that we're seeing sloshing around bond markets. I would like to see it sloshing around equity markets, <laughs> but it's mainly in bond markets, unfortunately. But if we look at that, our, our, our foreign borrowings have always been very low. Um, if, if we s sort of judge where we are currently, you know, we can borrow in dollar terms for five years plus at about 3%. Uh, okay, that's in dollars, but we've got a currency that is, is almost nine rand to the dollar that has weakened you know, 15, 20% over the last 18 to 24 months. So you don't want to start borrowing when your currency is strong. You want to borrow after your currency is weakened because then we think that risk that you run with foreign borrowing through a weaker currency has, has certainly diminished. So I'm, I'm, I, my view is they could have done a bit more on the international markets. It's now the right time to do it. Especially where we had offshore investors holding, what, 35.9% of South African debt last year, and that's surpassing local pension funds. Let's bring it back very quickly before we get into the break uh, to what we were talking about uh, in the sense of a restrictive labor environment that we're faced with right now, labor policy and legislation in that regard. Uh, some saying that uh, significant easing needs to happen in that regard as we see these tax incentives being brought to the table, given the kind of cost pressures that businesses face. Your view on that, Alan? Well, the easing that I think we need is an easing of the supply conditions in the labor market. The problem is that we don't have enough skilled people coming through into, into, into the economy, whether it's at the level of professionals, at the level of technicians, at the level of artisans. So what we really need is, is a much stronger flow through of supply. I think the fundamental problem in terms both of our competitiveness internationally and in terms of our ability to have inclusive growth is the weakness, the fact that we haven't been able to strengthen the education system en enough yet and the skills development system. Once those are addressed, I think many of the other issues in the labor market will, will sort themselves out. It's this tightness of the labor market uh, that's a result of a, of a small skills base um, that is leading to all of these problems, in my view. Well, let's hit pause on the conversation for now. We're heading into a quick commercial break, but when we continue, uh, we'll uh, be picking up on our uh, panel discussion right here in studio. There's more budget analysis right after this.